this society and business culture has led us to believe that, you know, you got to scale, you got to scale and you got to replace yourself to scale. And we're all about that. But if you do it the wrong way and, and you as the owner aren't willing to step in and intimately understand each role, mm -hmm. it's going to lead to a big culture problem in your firm. Mm -hmm. And it's going to lead to constant retention or retention issues, right? Turnovers happening. And it's going to lead to lackluster results because, as you said, we're not eating our own dog food. Correct. Right? We're not doing what we're asking the team to do. Hey, law firm owners, welcome to the Your Practice Master Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm MPS. I'm Richard James. And today we're going to discuss... Well, when to not scale, do the unscalable. The unscalable in relations to um, both different operations in your firm, but specifically building a team. Yeah, and let's say it's like go slow to go faster. Hmm. Does that make sense? Something we've been really putting into play lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we teach you to do what we do, and we do what we teach you to do, right? Which is you're running a small business, and um, it feels like you're changing the brakes on the car as you're driving down the road when you're putting fixes in place. And we're in hyper-growth mode. Um, my East Coast Italian bride could tell you that she hasn't seen as much as me as she wants. Uh, and she goes, it feels like you're in startup mode all over again. And we are, mm -hmm. right? And the reason it feels that way is because... You really need to slow down to go faster. And, and what that means is you got to do the unscalable. Right. Doing the unscalable. So I think we should start by defining the unscalable. Yeah. And I also think it goes against, like, especially all the business books that are out there about how to scale and build systems. And even some of the things we talk about is about scaling and building systems. But, but in or when you're first getting started, like when you're first, wh whether you're building a new practice area or you're starting to grow your firm or you're starting to learn how to market and sell, um, you really need to slow down and you can't just trust the idea that you're going to go hire some vendor and they're going to do it for you. And magically, you know, like I dream a genie, it's done and you don't have to worry about it. Or you're going to hire some team member and they're going to be intelligent and hardworking and they're just going to get it without your involvement. I don't think it works that way. No, I mean, it goes back to the same concept we always say. You know, you can't just write a big check or hit an easy button and then just hope, bingo, it's done. Right. I, I, at the end of the day, you can grow to the point where you replace yourself in these roles. But in order for that to happen, you need to have a pretty intimate understanding of what the role is, exactly what that role should be doing, and what the expectations are. And if you don't know what that is, and you don't know how the role should function, it's really difficult for you to inform a team member and expect them to just step in and exactly know what they're supposed to. And that's why doing the unscalable means you need to start by stepping into the different roles and functions in a firm. And don't get us wrong. As you said, we're all about systems. And really, it's systems that are going to run your practice while having people run those systems. But you need to know what those systems are to start with. Yeah, and so the from a, a lawyer hearing this, and I own a small law firm, I'm thinking, wait, I barely have time as it is. Mm -hmm. you're, you're asking me to do more? Well, you... <laughs> you could, res yeah, res I mean, the answer yeah, is yes. Yes, but respectfully, you, you need to set your expectations. I get it. Everybody's busy. I'm mm -hmm. just putting it out there. Everybody's busy. Mm -hmm. you, you ask a friend to hang out. They're busy. you got to find time and a schedule, right? You're a busy law firm owner. But if you want to grow your practice and you want to get to the point where you're not as busy in the sense that you're working in the day-to-day -day all the time, then the answer is yes. You need to set some time aside. And if that means working a little bit more, doing the unscalable, in order to get to that place, you got to start there. Yeah. So first I said you have to slow down to go faster. And now I'm going to tell them it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And, and that's be, but there's a difference. There's a difference in doing the job and feeling like time to make the donuts. Like I've got to go to work and do this every day as, as opposed to, no, 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 I'm doing this job to figure it out, to document it so that I can adequately replace myself with the system that I build and the person that runs the system. 
Yeah, I mean, it goes back to something you've always said. Anything, anyone could do anything for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. You're not necessary. I mean, if you've got plans of expansion, you're not necessarily committing to doing each of these roles forever yeah. and wearing every single hat always. Mm -hmm. You're doing it for a short period of time to gain an intimate knowledge of the role and what the expectations are. It's like a sprint. It's like a sprint. And sprints can get tiring. <laughs> yeah, well, you need to take a break in between. Them, right. right. You, you got to take a break. Let's start, let's start at the top. So let's, yeah. like, so. You have to think about where in your practice are you going to do the unscalable. And so part of it is it depends on where you're at. So everybody is at a different place in their firm. Mm -hmm. And so we like to say we meet people where they're at. And right. so I don't know when they're listening to this what where they are at. Mm -hmm. And so why don't we run through all of it and yeah. give them an example. So marketing. Yes. Okay. Marketing is a great one. So when we first launched, let's, let's give them an example of... Well, let, let me give you an example from the law firm, and then you can give them an example from what it's been looking like here. So when mm -hmm. I built a law firm in Phoenix back in the day, and we were doing the marketing, and, and I started breaking into television, mm. you know, you could hire a director, you could hire a vendor, you can have – and what I found is is that everybody's like, oh, yeah, just hire this company or just go hire that company. And I, what I realized is they don't really know what they're doing with respect. And so I found myself – if I wanted it to get done and figure it out and build a system around it, I had to get involved. So that means I was at the shoots for four or five, six hours, uh, it, you know, and the firm still needed to be run, right? I, I was the business manager running this growing firm. And so, but I was at the shoot for four or five, six hours figuring out what's the popular formula and system to manage one of these shoots. And so, you know, we would do one a week, two a week, and until I could get it to the point where I had a, a written documented system that I could then have this agency run for me, I was there. Now, once I had the agents, that the point the agency could run for me, well, now they ran it and I watched them run it and I knew they were doing it and I got confidence and now I didn't have to be there anymore. Right. But in the beginning, I had to be there to figure this out because if I just let them do it their way, their way didn't make a lot of sense. And so we teach our attorneys how to do it the right way um, so that they don't have to be subjected to a, an agency that doesn't do it really well when it comes to marketing. But they still can't trust that the agency is just going to go do it just because they give them instructions. They need to be there and make sure it's being done right. So in, so in your case, marketing now, when we started launching TCR and TSR mm -hmm. this year, uh, what, what did it look like for you being personally involved in the marketing? I had my hands on everything, mm -hmm. right? So we started by launching some Facebook ads, and I had a colleague of mine that uh, I knew knew Facebook ads very well, but that didn't mean I just turned it over, right? Mm -hmm. I was intimately involved in creating the ad copy, creating the creative. And to be frank, I was probably a bit of a pain in the ass with him because I was constantly trying to give him calls, trying to give him texts to understand not only the ads, the creative, but what he was doing in Facebook, mm -hmm. right, to understand what it was, mm -hmm. right? It's one thing to just say, here you go, run. Mm -hmm. But if we had no idea who the audience was, what the back end function of Facebook was. We'd be at their mercy. We'd be at their mercy. I'd have no idea if they were doing good, bad, and different. Right. I would just think, okay, this is just what it is, right? So intimately involved in every aspect of that. So what was the result of that, by the way? Well, the result was we started getting results, mm -hmm. right? I, I was able to identify, okay, here's what needs to happen in Facebook. Here's the type of creative we need to generate. Mm -hmm. Here's round about the type of ad copy we need to use. Obviously, your message always has to be fine-tuned a little bit. But I was able to get intimately involved in each of those so that way now we can have other members on our team start to take control of some of those functions. So, okay, fair enough. So let's put you in the attorney's shoes. How much did you know about running Facebook and Facebook ads when you got into this? Um, I didn't know much about running Facebook. I knew a little bit from research, but I didn't know much. And so you were able to figure out what you need to figure out by doing some research and by talking to the vendor and just being involved and doing it. Correct. And so that for you, you know, when you go, well, I don't know anything about Facebook ads and I don't want to be a Facebook marketer. Well, you don't either. No, I'm not in the Facebook marketing business, but I needed to know enough to know what was happening for the market, which is the top of the funnel. I mean, that's where the lead generation came from. So I needed to know that in order to put other people into that role, not only so that way I had peace of mind knowing what it was, but also so I didn't set the employee up for failure either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about uh, the next stage, appointment setting. So right. law firm example, 
when I was building the firm in Phoenix, I, I had a rough idea of what I was going to do with the script and running the structure, but you know, we teach this 11 steps, but that 11 steps was born out of thousands and thousands of phone calls that I ran through finally figuring it out. And so in the beginning, I, I needed to figure out a checklist. I needed to figure out a formula so I could make it trainable and easy. I just didn't want to rely on the talent of the individual, which mm -hmm. is what I did when I was younger. Sure. I just tried to hire really talented people, and I found it was harder and harder to find talented people. So I needed ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And so I needed to give them a formula, a structure, a system to use. Right. So... I literally would either get on the phone and I would answer the call and start to figure out what it was like. And I would take a handful of calls and then I would literally sit there and listen as they were doing it. And then when I finally was able to figure out how to record the calls, I would record the calls and I would listen to those and I'd go back and forth and tweak and play with it and tweak. And like in the first, you know, six months, I had hours invested in this phone script mm -hmm. to try to maximize our set rate because I just knew we had to get it right. right? I, I will tell you that like, even though I would say on a scale from 1 to 10 in being good at managing the phones in appointment setting, I felt like I was a 9. But even at a 9, because I was doing something that was a little bit new in a new industry way back when, in 2009-ish when I built this firm, I felt like I needed to be personally involved to understand what these calls were like and how right. they differed, right? Mm -hmm. And so the law firm needs to be involved in – the owner needs to be involved in this process so they understand what they're asking their team to do. Now, you got personally involved when we were driving these new to set appointments, right? Well, I, again, I needed to know every system, right? So, all right, now I learned the marketing aspect. Well, now it's generating leads. Now I got to figure out, all right, how do we turn these leads into an appointment? So I stepped into that role and, you know, I was, for lack of better terms, on call. Every single time a new lead would come in, you know, we developed a formula, no shorter than two minutes, no longer than 10 minutes mm -hmm. to be able to respond to that lead. And so I was making phone calls. I was sending text messages. I was sending emails every single time a new lead came in. Well, how, how demanding was that? Very. It's, it's a time consuming role because not only are you now trying to focus on every other aspect of the business, but now you're also trying to make sure you're responding to these leads in that time period, which is tough because you get notified and then you got to jump right to and, and get onto it. But as a result of that, we developed a system mm -hmm. and a system that worked. Mm -hmm. And so then we were able to find someone else and plug them into that role. But even still, we had to inspect, mm -hmm. right? So you had to make sure, okay, here's what I want to be happening. Is it actually happening? And so you do that through the inspection of making sure they're sending the text or making sure they're calling and listening to the call recordings, just like you said. You, but you were able to, once you figured it out, you were able to then, you know, it was, I think it was three, four weeks you did it. And then you were able to hand it off to somebody. Correct. Like, but this is the formula we want you to use, right? Right. So you could replace yourself. So you didn't, you weren't answering those calls going, I'm going to do this forever. No. You answered them going, I'm going to figure this out, and then I'm going to get somebody else to run it. I, I went in with one goal, and that is to figure out how to maximize the number of those leads turn into set appointments. And once I got that formula is when I knew I had a system and I could turn it over to somebody else. Right. And so, again, we give you formulas. Like, if you're in our world, you get a formula of how to use this system of, of setting the appointments. But... The owner still has to be involved. They still have to be make sure all their team has buy-in. They need to be just they have to be involved. They, if they're not, the team doesn't buy in, right? Well, that's the problem, and I think that leads us into our next one, which is consults, hire rate. Correct. Right. So this is where I see a lot of attorneys go a little sideways uh, mm -hmm. is when you're maybe taking the leap and hiring a non-attorney salesperson or, or an, an attorney, attorney or a paralegal, yeah. whoever's yeah. going to run the consultations, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, we have the structure in place and the same thing. You, you've got to run the consultations to develop and understand the structure, use the structure, mm -hmm. use the formula. So that way, when that person comes in that you want to replace yourself with, again, whether that's a non-attorney, attorney, doesn't really matter. They can see that you also do what you're asking them to do because if you walk into a consultation and now they're shadowing, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation where they're bringing a new rep on, right? right. And then they're like, so, so what should I do? And I should, and I was like, all right, well, we've got to go through onboarding. They got to memorize the script. They got to get that down. And then they should go through a shadow period. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask, so just to confirm, obviously you're fine. The 19 steps, right? Well, no, not in my consult. Right. So now right. we're going to ask. So do as I say, not as I do. Right. So now we're going to ask someone to come on and follow this structure that we're not even following. And it leads to a misalignment between you and that person, because now they can easily call you out and say, well, then why aren't you doing this? Right. And so that's just it doesn't set a good example. That's where it comes to doing the unscalable. You have to be willing 
despite whether or not you like it, want to do it, you have to be willing to do it to lead by example so that way this person could see that you're also doing this. Yeah, yeah no, it's well said. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you, can't, you can't live your practice in a do as I say, not as I do type of way. And so the unscalable is you becoming comfortable with that script. Let's move on to getting paid for those firms that are not contingency based and they actually have to get paid. I was working with a firm, uh, you know, let's call it last year, end of year, end of year, they needed a big push. And they're like, you know, I just can't get my team to hit the goals and collect. And I go, okay. I go, uh, how often do you meet with your team about their goals that they're collecting? He's like, I don't. I'm like, oh, I go, okay. How, how often do you have a review of what goals you've achieved and reviewing some calls from, you know, that they've made when they're trying to hit these goals? He goes, yeah, I don't. I goes, I just gave them a goal and I expected them to hit it because it, I go, that's not how it works. Like the leader has got to be involved to the extent where they're like, okay, everybody, here's the goal where it's on the whiteboard. You can assign some duties, but like you have to be involved in leading them on a daily basis of, okay, you know, if you wanted to collect $25,000 this uh, to hit your goal over and above what you normally do, whatever, well, that means that's $5,000 a day. Uh, and that means that, you, you know, by noon, we need to have $2,500 collected. So if it's me, I'm having a check-in meeting at noon every day. And then I have a check-in meeting at 5 o'clock every day to see where we ended up. And if we didn't hit it, I'm going to up the goal for the next day. And I'm going to set the goal for the next day. And then the next day, we're going to have a morning kickoff meeting, a little a stand-up rally. And then we're going to have a meeting at noon to review where we are. Then we're going to have a meeting at 5 to see where we are. If you have a hyper-aggressive goal that you want your sales team or collection team or somebody to hit because you're trying to make up some ground on the year or you're trying to make up some shortfall or you're just trying to get old, whatever, clean up an old mess, whatever it is, if you've got a goal that you're trying to achieve, You've got to lead your team that way, right? It just doesn't happen if you just like go, oh, here's, you know, you're a good team. You're intelligent. You work hard. You know what you're doing. Here's your goal. You guys believe in that goal? Yep. Okay, go get it. And then show up on the day the goal is supposed to be hit and go and be surprised that they didn't hit the goal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. No, and I think, think some of this too is business society and business culture has led us to believe that, you know, you got to scale, you got to scale, and you got to replace yourself to scale. Mm -hmm. And we're all about that. But if you do it the wrong way and, and you as the owner aren't willing to step in and intimately understand each role, mm -hmm. it's going to lead to a big culture problem in your firm. Mm -hmm. And it's going to lead to constant retention or retention issues, right? Turnovers happening. And it's going to lead to lackluster results because, as you said, we're not eating our own dog food. Correct. Right? We're, we're not doing what we're asking the team to do. Yep. And so I think the important point here is that you've got to be willing to do the unscalable and you've got to be willing to do that in each of the roles until you intimately understand them so that way you can instruct your team on what to do and you'll get to the point where you still have to make sure they're trained there's maintenance but you're going to get to the point where if you've done that and you've given them the proper system and now all you have to do is inspect that system you're not going to be doing the unscalable forever. No. I mean, look, so uh, we didn't talk about workflow, which is many law firm owners love to talk about workflow. It's yeah. the sexiest thing. You know, get the work done. Uh -huh. I get a capacity issue. I got to get it all done. Document they, collection. They, they, they just think, like, workflow is where it's at. they like, give me a new software to do workflow. Give me a new software to automate billing. Give me a new software to, manage, to make sure my team gets the tasks done, handles customer service. All that stuff is important, right? It is. But, but and you and I lean heavily on marketing and sales because we believe you, you don't have any workflow to do if you don't sell something. That's right? correct. Workflow is important, but, I mean, it goes, okay. it goes hand in it hand. It goes hand in hand. So, so anyway, here I am, and we're, we're pretty good at sales. And so now I raise my hand and go, look, I'm going to go figure out, while you do the coaching consulting on the staffing in the, in the intake room intake and, closing, and the yeah. closing room, I'm going to do the setup for the staffing room, make sure we have all the systems set up in Mexico and make sure that – we know how the recruiting goes and how the interview goes and talk to the client and do the onboarding and all the stages, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm slammed, right? Yeah. And, and my wife's telling me I'm complaining. Maybe I'm whining a little. She's probably right. Okay, I'm, I'm, you I'm, are pretty darn busy. But I'm not doing it. Like, I'm literally doing – I had a client say to me the other day. She goes, I was – happy to hire your firm. She goes, I had no idea like you were going to do the interview. Like I had no idea you were going to interview my employee. I had no idea you, you were going to help place my, and that's not going to be the case forever. Correct. But right now I need to make sure what is the proper structure for the right interview to ask 
for these folks to make sure we get the right answers to figure out what the good ones are, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm measuring, okay, how many interviews did I did? How many did I reject? How many rejected us? How many did I bring on? How many of those that I brought on worked? It, what am I missing? What am I hitting? So I can build a formula for mm -hmm. somebody else. And, and then it's like, okay, well, once we start the onboarding, what does the onboarding look like for when they come in? Is there, what does their 96-hour test look like to make sure that they can actually hit the script and the structure and hit their marks? And then from what, what is, does the handoff look like to the employer? What, how do we make sure we have everything we need from them? And it's just all these little details that, yeah, I could delegate to my team, but I'm trying to right now figure it out myself. I'm doing the unscalable so that I can replace myself in a way that is not going to give me headaches later. Yeah, and develop a system that you stand behind too. Correct. Right, because that's the other you, – you pass it off to your team. Um, look, you might get lucky and have a team as, as personally invested in your business as you are, but it's not likely. Right. And so there's – not calling people out, but usually if you tell them, here's a blank slate, go build it, there's going to be holes in it. There's going to be gaps in it. There's going to be some corners cut because you weren't intimately involved in that process. So if you want a solid process that you stand behind and you're like, yes, this is what we follow every single time. This is what maximizes the client experience. Then you have to be involved in that. Otherwise, someone else is not going to care as much about your practice as you do. Yeah, and things need to change, and sometimes on the fly. And some, you've got so much experience as an owner or as an attorney that's got a lot of experience in certain workflow. Like, you know how to adapt to changing situations and fix and change the system where your team is just going to not know how to do that. Right. And so in the beginning, when you're building something new or, or you're building something for the first time, you being involved allows you to see things in a way just your staff's not going to see. And so, again, this is back to doing the unscaled. In order to go faster, you got to go slow. You got to go slow in order to go faster, mm -hmm. right? And it might get worse before it gets better. You might feel like you went back into chaos for a little while. I know I do right now. Yeah. But, but I know there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I know as soon as I think get this thing hammered out, I'm going to have somebody else be able to run it, right? But none of this stuff, this workflow stuff matters unless we get sales. And everything else we talked about in marketing and sales requires all this too. So... I, I think this was a good topic for them that they had to hear. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, had to hear, right, need to hear. Uh, we may not want to hear that, mm -hmm. right, because it just, to be honest, it means more work. Mm -hmm. But it's something you should hear because it's something that's going to lead to a better practice overall. So mm -hmm. I think today was helpful, but we'll let you be the judge of that. If it was, go ahead, don't forget to hit that like button, comment your thoughts, and as always, hit that subscribe button, turn those bell notifications or that follow button, depending on where you're watching or listening on. There's a reason for that. Yeah. Because of the agreement that we have with them. Right. We're going to put the work in. We're going to give you this information. In, in return, you're, you're going to make sure that you keep up your end of the bargain and you like, subscribe, follow, do all those things. They call it a gentleman's agreement, right? A gentleman's agreement. Right. If this is your first time, great, it was free. After this, you want to watch some more, the fee... Like, follow, subscribe. Yeah, we ask for nothing Comment. else other than that. And look, if you'd like to take the leap and learn a little bit more about working with us, down in the description, we've got a link. We'd happy to set up a free breakthrough call to sit down and speak with you about your practice and where you're at. Yeah, yeah agreed. All right, I think this was good. I think so. Thank you for listening today. Make it a great day.